Thank you everyone for coming and joining us today for, for this presentation. I'm really excited to, to be able to tell you a little bit about the type of research we do and to exemplify these projects, these research strategies using projects from Florida specifically, uh, including projects that uh, with our lab done in collaboration with Coast Project, with Savannah and also her uh, mentor, uh, Tom Frazier, who is now at the University of South Florida. So um, what I will present today reflects collaboration across many programs and many institutions. And so what I would like to do today is to, first of all, introduce you to an emerging discipline within paleontology. It actually cuts across multiple disciplines, including archaeology and historical ecology. And we refer to this discipline as conservation paleobiology because we think that the youngest fossil record can provide us with opportunities to contribute to issues related to conservation management and restoration. But we are non-applied scientists. And I think there is a long way between where we are right now in trying to develop some of those approaches and showcasing them and the time when we actually will be really useful. So I'll spend some time explaining to you the whole concept of how we can use fossils and other related types of geohistorical records to contribute to conservation and to contribute to our understanding of environmental changes. And then I'll look at specific examples from, uh, from our work in Florida in aquatic ecosystems, including seagrass uh, uh, sites. So one of the main points of extending our research into this fossil, deeper fossil record and archeological resources is that high quality, rigorous scientific records of environment and ecosystems are actually really limited temporally. So, you know, if you look actually at rigorous scientific data regarding continuous tracking of temperature or, or plankton diversity or what have you, very rarely do we have records for more than a few decades and virtually never do we have records that extend beyond industrial revolution. So we do not have really good ways of accessing scientific information uh, using standard methods. However, there are various historical archives that we can uh, tap into to access information about, uh, say, archaeological middens or uh, young fossil record from the previous centuries and millennia, or even historical records. And we, we can use these various historical approaches to look at pre-industrial times, to look at times before humans became a major force, or even to look at times when humans were barely present on this planet. I will mostly focus on mollusks. I will talk about clams and snails. And uh, excuse me for a moment, I just need to close the door. I realize it's open. One moment. Sorry about that. That's the, the wonder of using Zoom for presentations. Um, so I'll focus primarily on, on shells, uh, uh, but these approaches and these strategies and these qualities of the records really apply to many other systems, including bones of terrestrial vertebrates, including microfossils, including pollen grains. And a lot of the logic that, that we, we apply for to shells, um, we, we can also apply to, uh, to other types of records. But again, I'll be using shells. And I'll start with explaining why we think that these methods can actually provide some powerful information. And there are seven reasons for that in my mind. Uh, first of all, my screen froze, so here it is. First of all, shells from the youngest fossil record are everywhere. We find them on the beaches, we find them in uh, dunes, on, in deserts, we find them in riverbanks, we find them on the seafloor. So it's really easy to access this type of record uh, and to, we can access it from Arctic to equatorial zones. The other important thing about very young fossil record is the fact that most of these organisms are still around today. So when we find a shell or a bone, typically we can identify it to species level. And with that identification comes a lot of information because these things are still around. So 
And just by naming a species like this clam, Molinia modesta, I am also identifying a lot of other pieces of information, such as that this is a bivalve mollusk, that today it's endemic to the Gulf of California, that it lives in sands and mats, that it feeds from suspension and it, filter feeds, it fil filters the water. It uh, prefers to thrive in slightly brackish to fully marine habitats. And today it's mostly found at the mouth of the Colorado River. So just by identifying a shell, I can tell a lot about that organism. Also, shells and other fossils carry information about interactions between those organisms and other organisms. So for example, on the left, we have a, a test of a, a Holocene echinoid. You can see this puncture hole. This was actually, this is actually a record of a kill by a helmet snail. So we can actually not only document uh, this organism, but also we can know that it was killed and very likely consumed by a snail. Uh, on the right, we have another shellfish. It's a brachiopod from a Brazilian shelf. And you can see that it's encrusted by a, a sequence of colonizers that essentially colonized the inner part of the shell, indicating that this specimen was laying on the seafloor for a while and water currents were flowing around it, allowing other organisms to thrive. So there is much more information in these uh, carbonate pieces than just the identity of the organism. But the main reasons why these approaches are becoming really powerful in terms of information value is various advancements in technology. So first of all, our instrumentation for various type of geochemical analysis are continuously improving. So we can analyze very high resolution data, uh, for example, looking at stable isotopes of oxygen in individual growth rings. And we can use that modern clamp, for example, to see that Oxygen isotopes track the temperature. Growth bent at nanoscale tell us the growth rates and how they vary for seasons. These are things we can potentially extract not just from modern organisms, but also from fossil ones. And one of the most potent and important uh, geochemical analysis that we can do is dating. And so we have a variety of techniques, such as in particular radiocarbon and amino acid racemization that can be cross-checked against one another and to cross-validate, if you will. And these methods allow us to essentially date individually fossil specimens. So we can understand what is the age structure of shell material that we see on the surface. And these type of projects have been done increasingly over the last three decades. And with that came one truly amazing realization. And this is just an example, but these type of patterns are observed all over the world when we deal with shell accumulations. Here we're looking at essentially individually dated radiocarbon dated shells of bivalves. So in this case, it's a small clam collected from the seafloor, from the surface on the Brazilian shelf. And this is age frequency distribution. So you can see that you know most of the shells are young. So more than 70 specimens are from last 500 years. But we also see that Laying on the surface, we also have shells that are 1,000 years old, 3,000 years old, 5,000 years old. Some of them are more than 10,000 years old. And in fact, this is not an exceptional situation. This is a rule that we now see to be very per pervasive and widespread globally in different habitats for different type of organisms. So organisms essentially, the, after they die, if they have preservable skeletons, they can create this time-rich archive that we can tap into. And so it is pretty amazing if you think that when you walk on a beach today uh, along the coast of Florida and you pick up a random shell, chances are pretty good that this shell is pre-Columbian or maybe even from the times of Julius Caesar uh, and maybe even older. So this realization that essentially what's on the surface represents centuries or even millennia of record is really what underlies and forms the foundation for conservation paleobiology. Finally, we have increasing access to powerful methodology, to analytical methods, to modeling methods, to multidimensional methods that allow us to assemble all these data together and put them into some powerful story where we can rigorously analyze statistical behavior of our data and explore uh, multivariate complexities of those data. So 
these are all sort of reasons when we put them together for which we think conservation paleobiology works. So just to sum this up, the seven reasons why we think these historical data offer us a real power is that first of all, there is a lot of data everywhere on the surface that we can identify data points quite credibly to species level and that itself contains a lot of information that there is also the record of biotic interactions that those pieces of carbonate shell contain. More importantly, we have all these rapid advances in uh, instrumentation. So we, we can acquire cheaper, faster, more precise, high quality data. We can date fossils. And with this came the realization that actually what's on the surface on in a very shallow subsurface is actually representing hundreds to thousands of years of history. And it provides background information about the past conditions of the ecosystems. And we can pull together all these wonderful data and actually apply powerful analytical method methods to analyze them. So this, in, in, in a nutshell, is this whole idea of conservation paleobiology, that we are using this geohistorical data augmented and by leveraging uh, modern instrumentation, modern analytical methods, radiocarbon dating, and so on. And the implications here are potentially the fact that we can really look at the long-term ecosystem dynamics. We can understand pre-anthropogenic baselines. And by baseline, I don't mean a particular state, but just variation in, that naturally occurs in systems. That allows us to calibrate changes that we see uh, due to human processes. Um, and this historical perspective on ecosystem Resilience can also contrast natural resi resilience versus anthropogenic resilience. And ultimately, we hope that these type of approaches will not only allow us to estimate the magnitude of, of human-made changes, but also help to assess restoration efforts or calibrate them. And one of the main ways in which we do this, uh, so I want to also spend some time on explaining how we do this, is by comparing living to dead. And this is very often referred to in our circles as fidelity analysis. And that simply is a statement about how faithful is the death assemblage or cementary of dead shells relative to the, the living organisms. And let me just illustrate this by telling you just, you know, a soul story or a, a fairy tale. Uh, you know, imagined long time ago in a far, far away ocean on a seafloor, uh, there was a happy community. Uh, and this community consisted of just uh, some snails and some clams. And of course, this community from a long time ago would essentially continue living through time. So some of these snails and clams would die and they would stay around the surface or maybe um, they will get buried uh, to shallow depth and essentially form what we will call death assemblage. And as the generations proceed and proceed, this death assemblage will acquire more and more of the remnants. So the cemetery will grow and the community will live on top of it. So still long ago, we see some subtle changes in the community, but it's really not changing much. And so this death assemblage is kind of static, very much like the community. Uh, yet later, you know, some time ago, we still see uh, the same situation, very similar community. But now, of course, over the hundreds of years or thousands of years, millions of shells accumulated from previous generations. So the community that lives, and this is a critical point, is a very tiny amount of individuals comparing to the cemetery that is underneath or on the surface. So if something changes dramatically, as in this example, if something changes in such a way like here where clams disappeared, snails became smaller, and then there are some really ugly sea urchins that came in and messed up the, the system, this is not gonna be reflected very quickly in the death assemblage because there are millions of clams and snails from the previous times. So we will see very rapid divergence between what we see in the living community and what we see in the deaf assemblage, which will tell us that there has been some recent changes and it will even tell us what these changes were. Of course, there is a flip side to this and that is we can also use the same logic to find places where things have not changed. So if there was no change today, we will still have the same community and that community will match 
the deaf assemblage. So we will have a situation when we have what we would call high fidelity, where life track what was in the past in the dead. And we can translate this into numerical analysis. So for example, if we have high fidelity, we would expect that species that are abundant in deaf assemblage are also abundant in living communities. Uh, conversely, if we have low fidelity, if ecosystems changed recently, we will expect that life abundance is not going to match dead abundance. So some species may be common in life community, but not so in the deaf assemblage. So the, the correlation between rank abundance of life and species and dead species is one measure of how uh, unaltered the system is. And I'm not gonna show those results, but there's actually a meta-analysis that shows very nicely that when systems are disturbed, that correlation declines. And if the systems are in good shape, that correlation is retained. We can also think of samples. So if we have multiple stations uh, in a system that had, has not been disturbed, the life and that will actually have very similar composition. So they will occupy a space uh, with the same faunal composition if we run some type of a multivariate analysis to organize these samples in terms of funnel compositions, samples that are alive and dead on the left panel will be very similar in composition because there is high fidelity. On the other hand, if there has been dramatic changes in recent years or decades, live samples will have a very different composition from the past. And our cemetery will be a legacy of a different community and our living communities will be a, a novel state. So that's sort of the idea behind fidelity analysis. And by the way, I wanna acknowledge the wonderful artists who, whose uh, images I stole for this uh, particular set of graphs. So I I'm gonna highlight a few brief examples. Actually, each of those examples could be a 40 minute talk. We, you know, I will be really skimming the surface, but. I thought it would be more useful to give you a flavor of the type of things we do and what type of answers we hope to achieve rather than go in depth into one specific example. So here we're looking at seagrasses. This is uh, along uh, the nature coast, along uh, uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. And we essentially collected uh, uh, samples, life and dead samples along a number of stations. They actually correspond to coast stations the with water quality control that were mentioned before, uh, but I will not talk about relations between water quality and these data, even though that's a very interesting topic as well. So we can essentially look at these systems and we can, in each of the seagrass sites, we can collect live community surveys. So we can see what type of molluscan organisms live there, what types of clams and snails we find. And we can also collect deaf assemblages. As always, we want to know first what these deaf assemblages represent in terms of time. And it turns out that in this case, we dated uh, almost a hundred specimens. And so these are individually dated uh, clams. And you can see that very much like in previous cases, while we have a lot of young specimens, there is a lot of older specimens going back to Roman times again. And to, in fact, the median age is roughly coincident with industrial revolution. So in essentially what this estimate tells us is that half of the shells that we find in our samples are pre-industrial, half are from more recent centuries, and maybe about 20 to 30% are from the last hundred years or so. So this is mostly large, older record, but it's all mixed or time averaged. If we look actually at live community as a whole pulled across all data versus deaf assemblage, we actually see that there is a very good congruence between the two. In other words, there's high fidelity. This, the rank correlation is more than 0.6. And in top 30 species, nearly all species that are in top 30 live are also in top 30 dead and vice versa. And in many cases, what is common today in death is also common in life and vice versa. Um, so this is really suggesting that these communities have not changed dramatically. If pre-industrial communities were dramatically different, then remember half of the shells from the deaf assemblage would come from those different, very different communities and we would have a very different picture. We can actually highlight this even better by looking at correlations at sites. So 
as I showed on the map, we have multiple sites. So at each site, we have a pair of life and death communities or cemetery and the living community compared to one another. So we can look at correlations in terms of abundance of species between the two. And we have frequency of the correlations for uh, 96 samples in this case. We can see that these samples have all positive correlations. So every site we go to typically has a correlation uh, that is positive, significantly positive in a statistical sense. And the average is about 0.5. Uh, uh, and essentially, so it looks probably more like the panel on the right, which shows this uh, higher correlation. Zero would be kind of a shotgun, no relation between life and death, and negative would be inverse relation where things common in death are rare in life and vice versa. One point to realize is that while 0.5 may not seem impressive, remember that part of the, that even if there was a perfect fidelity, if the agreement was 100%, just due to sampling, we would expect uh, values lower than one because of the boundary condition and because of the sampling issues. And you can see here on the right, a blue distribution. This is a simulation of what that correlation should be if the system was perfect. If our system essentially came, life and death came from the same underlying population. And just due to sampling, as you can see, even for a perfect system, the correlation will be 0.7. So 0.5 is actually really remarkable. It suggests that life and death are nearly identical. This is consistent with other studies that suggest that this particular seagrass system has not been altered as heavily as many other systems around the world. So, so sometimes the, the news we can provide or data we can provide are kind of positive and, and they reassure validity of, of protecting those areas because they really are still very similar to what they've been for the last 2000 years. We can also look at spatial patterns. And in this case, what I'm looking at here is uh, just one of the estuaries, uh, Stinhachi. And so this is uh, farther north from Cedar Key. And in this study, one of our students, uh, Chalan Hyman, focused on comparing uh, Molaskan communities and assemblages between seagrass systems and unvegetated open sands. So the yellow intuitively are sites which have been known not to have any seagrasses for at least uh, 40 years uh, due to multiple surveys. These green ones are the sites which actually are known to have seagrasses or have been vegetated with seagrasses for at least since 1980s. So there is a really a kind of a very different habitat locally. These patches of seagrass are, uh, you know, maybe multiple square kilometers in size. So this is like a mosaic of sand and seagrass. Uh, that that occurs in the area, and it's an interesting question how dynamic, spatially, this 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 landscape is through longer intervals of time. Are these seagrasses kind of eternally sitting in single places, or are the boundaries between unvegetated and vegetated areas change? So what we can do again, we, we can look at live dead comparisons, and this is an ordination. So essentially, these points are samples, and if they plot close to each other. That means that they have very similar species suites, so similar communities. If they plot far away on the graph, that means that the composition of fauna is very different. Not surprisingly, if we look at live community, it's all these points here, the greens, uh, which are seagrasses, are very distinct from open sand. They plot on exact opposite ends of this plot. Uh, and Within each group, there is actually quite, quite, quite high homogeneity. So all these samples have very similar funnel compositions. There is more variation in open sands, um, but that's a story for a different day. Uh, but what's really fascinating here is that if we look at deaf assemblages, this is the same ordination, we see the same story. We see actually a very clear separation between uh, seagrass deaf assemblages and sands. Now remember, these are modern seagrass and sand habitats, whereas these deaf assemblages represent a 2000 year history of these systems. And yet they actually plot separate and consistent in their position with uh, modern seagrass and sand communities. And what it tells us is essentially an indication that the ecological landscape 
must have been relatively stable for a time because imagine a situation where seagrasses were shifting their boundaries. So sometimes a given site was a seagrass and sometimes it was open sand. If that's the case, then this time average depth assemblage will accumulate species suites that mix both habitats and essentially everything would overlap on everything. We couldn't differentiate them. It's only if we have a situation like this where these boundaries are relatively static that this long-term time average signal could preserve a distinction between seagrasses and open sands. So that's really a, a very strong suggestion that the seagrass patches are not sort of accidentally distributed in the system, but where we find them, there are some unique long-term characteristics that allow them to thrive. And where we don't find them, it's not because of necessarily of our actions, but it could be that these areas have never been conducive to seagrass development. So this gives us really this historical perspective uh, on, on seagrasses. And finally, in the last example, I will move away from seagrasses to uh, freshwater habitats that are influenced, influenced by, uh, by the sea. Uh, and we'll look specifically at Wakala River and we'll use again, very similar logic. So we'll be looking in this case at assemblages of freshwater mollusks. We look at living communities as well as uh, fossil communities that are preserved in riverbanks. So you can see here a picture, uh, underwater picture of a riverbank. These sediments are full of shells and we can sample them vertically to, to create sort of a stratigraphic history uh, of that particular system. And we can concurrently look at living communities in the same system. And so here we're looking at Wakala River. Uh, the upper part of the river has been designated as a protected area, as a park. Uh, and the lower part is uh, essentially unprotected. The lowermost part of this uh, river system is uh, influenced by estuaries, so there is more influenced uh, by seawater and some fluctuations in salinity. Um, and this is essentially a system we decided, one of the systems we are studying in terms of how these living communities compare to the deaf assemblages. Again, the first thing we want to know is for what is actually the age structure of those systems. And we can see here the radiocarbon dates of terrestrial snails that live in proximity of, uh, of the river and get mixed together with freshwater snails. Uh, we don't use freshwater snails because they are very difficult to date using radiocarbon or other techniques, but uh, there are developments in recent years that demonstrate that small terrestrial snails can be dated really well. And that was indeed the case when we tested the quality of our radiocarbon dating. And what you can see here is essentially that the age distribution is primarily concentrated in very early Holocene. So Holocene. So most of these shells are coming from between seven and 10,000 years ago. Uh, and this actually makes a lot of sense because during the interglacial sea level rise uh, at the beginning of the Holocene, uh, all these springs and lakes were reactivated in Florida. So this is when they became active again. Uh, and not surprisingly, that's when we see a spike of, uh, of uh, mollusks that live in these springs. So essentially the bottom line is that most of our shell material in this case, as suggested by radiocarbon dating, is from the early Holocene. So when the sea level was still, still lower and probably human influence was very limited. Okay, so what happened is that when we were doing our research, uh, after our first survey, a, a catastrophic event affected the area, including Wakola River. So I'm sure all of you know the story, the, the, the Hurricane Michael, which has no relation to me whatsoever, despite the same name. Uh, and that landed essentially in Florida Panhandle in October, 2018. And essentially the surge was so strong that the Wakola River uh, water reversed all the way to the head spring. So essentially there was a reverse flow uh, and uh, a lot of sort of a, more salty water was pushed into the river. So that gave us opportunity to see what happened to the live communities because we just did a survey before the hurricane. Uh, and we essentially have data from 11 sites where we surveyed live communities uh, and uh, 
sometimes due to logistic reasons, uh, we miss data for a particular site. In this case, for example, there was a very aggressive um, large alligator and we decided that our science was not that important to, to risk our lives. So we, we move on to other sites. But what you can see here, essentially each bar is a, a summary of species present in a given site and green colored uh, pieces of bar are species that are uh, native to the system. The red are non-native species, uh, things such as corbicularia or, or other invasives. And blue is one species of uh, narrate snails that is actually typically occurring in, in estuarian and uh, coastal settings, but it's actually uh, urihaline and it can uh, function in rivers it's just the dispersal is very difficult for this uh, snail in because of it, the way it reproduces. So we, you can see here that before hurricane, we have a system that's already disturbed to some extent. You know, there are these, uh, you know, brackish species occupying and dominating in the lower part of the river. And then we have some sites where the non-native species are even dominant. After the hurricane, we did a survey two months later Again, one of the sites couldn't be surveyed. And we can see actually that non-native non species recovered much quicker after the hurricane. That's very common with disturbances uh, observed in many systems. The, the brackish uh, species seems to be thriving uh, and really dominating in the lower part of the river. And when we repeated this seven months later, uh, the situation somewhat improved in the park, in the protected area, so in upstream, where we, we have mostly green and brown species, which are native, uh, but it is actually heavily uh, invaded by non-native species in the middle part, and you can see that the brackish species is heavily established. And you may want to sort of say, okay, you know, this is, this is not conservation paleobiology, and you would be right, this is just a a series of ecological surveys. These type of studies are done in many systems, but notice that we really don't know what the system was like in the deeper past before invasive species, before uh, the high sea level rise, before human interventions. So it's really hard to evaluate how dramatic this hurricane event is. Is, is this really a catastrophic shift in the condition of this ecosystem? Or is this something that is relatively trivial? And the only really the only way to answer in my mind is to know what that system was like long term in the past. So now we can look at our fossil samples from the same system. So I added them on the top. And what you can see is multiple things that are striking. First of all, we have lots of species at any given site and throughout the entire system. Most of these species are not patchy. They are con continuously present through the entire system. We do have a uh, missing data point, but I don't think that would change anything given how pervasive this, this uh, pattern is. Of course, we do not have non-native species because that's you know early Holocene. Uh, so way long before these species were invaded these systems. But in, more importantly, we don't have any in indication or any evidence for brackish species. In fact, these low, lower level, uh, lower part of the river is very diverse with native species. And some of the native species we see here are actually not uh, present in the river anymore. So these, these fossil data tell us that there are local extirpations that already took place. We have looked at uh, multiple rivers actually, and it turns out that if we look at samples, live samples are very different from dead samples. So this is very different than seagrasses. Here we can clearly see that live samples marked in green have a very different faunal composition from gray samples, which are fossil samples from the same river system. This is Silver River and Aqualaha and then uh, Wakala. Uh, and even if we remove uh, non-native species which drive this pattern, we still see a huge difference between living and dead. So we can we can see that the, the early ecosystems of these rivers after activation of the springs had very different faunal composition than we see today. And that gives us a starting point to sort of ask, you know, what you know, what type of changes occur, you know, how diversity changed, which species disappeared, 
how the regions differ, you, you, is it more heterogeneous or less? Uh, and this type of data, I think, can quantify some of those questions uh, or, or quantify some of the answers. So I, I want to stress at the end uh, that fossils and other historical data have been long used uh, to assess just human ecosystem interactions and human impacts. But I think what's different now is that we can leverage all these new advancements in other disciplines, uh, advanced instrumentation, uh, innovative computational methods. And we also have now this realization how much time is represented uh, by these uh, superficial young fossil records. And we also have means to essentially estimate numerically what is the age structure of the, the record that we look at uh, in a particular region. And so because of this very extensive mixing and survival of shell material, these cemeteries uh, of mollusk cemeteries uh, typically give us a centennial to millennial timescale archives, which we cannot really access uh, using modern scientific data. They, they just simply don't go back that far time, that far back in time. And so, so I hope I, I was able to convince you that it, there is something valuable in doing this type of research. It, it really does provide us uh, a long-term dynamics of natural ecosystems. And it may ultimately help us to, and to, to have more informed picture of what these systems be, may, what is the behavior of those systems under natural conditions over longer timescales. And I want to sort of at the end, just uh, as a little uh, advertisement, mention that uh, our museum um, is also a host for a NSF-funded uh, 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 research network called Conservation Paleobiology Network. Uh, this figure is a little bit out of date, but we actually have over 600 members, scientists, students, practitioners, uh, and citizen scientists uh, from over, I think, close to 50 countries by now. And anyone can join this if, if they're interested, it's, it's free. And we also will have a conference in February in Gainesville dedicated to conservation paleobiology approaches. So, you know, if, if, if any of you is interested to learn more about this topic, uh, you can go to this website. Uh, I, I, and of course you can contact me directly as well. I'm always happy to talk about those topics. And needless to say, there's lots of people involved here. I already mentioned Tom Frazier, but there are many students and many professionals who participated in projects that were partly highlighted here. Thank you.